program has been made possible by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. It was the end of summer in 1911. A solitary Indian left his homeland in the foothills of Mount Lassen. As a boy, he had seen his people massacred. For more than 40 years, he had lived in hiding with a tiny band of survivors. Now the others were dead. There was no one left in the world who spoke his language. Alone and near starvation, he walked out into the white man's world. the outskirts of Oroville, California. Ad Kessler was working at a slaughterhouse when he heard dogs barking. He saw a man emerge from the darkness. I grabbed up a stick. I pushed him over. I felt ashamed with what I did. I put him back up in a sitting position and he put his two hands together and whispered something which I just couldn't understand. The sheriff didn't know what to make of the man. He took him to Oroville and locked him in a cell for the insane until the Bureau of Indian Affairs could decide what to do with him. There he was, a perfect stranger locked in an iron cell. He didn't know what we were gonna do with him, maybe take him out and shoot him or something. Curious townspeople flocked to the jail. Reporters rushed to file sensational stories describing the frightened, emaciated Indian as a savage, Stone Age wild man. He is the last surviving member of the Deer Creek tribe, long believed to be extinct. His feet were almost as wide as they were long, showing plainly that he had never worn either moccasins or he shoes. He speaks in an unknown tongue. He is as strange as a visitor from another he world. He is a savage of the most primitive kind. By this time, most people thought Indians had vanished with the Wild West. Romanticized Indians galloped across silent movie screens, while real American Indians were living on distant reservations, forced to give up their languages and traditions. At the same time, a new breed of scientists called anthropologists scoured the country for living Indians who remembered the old tribal ways. They believed that when the elders died, their cultures would die with them. One of the most ambitious of the young anthropologists was Alfred Kroeber. At the turn of the century, he journeyed west to California and became the first professor in the new anthropology department at Berkeley. Kroeber traveled up and down the state looking for native speakers. But the Indians Kroeber met had been profoundly changed by contact with whites. He wanted to find wild, uncontaminated Indians. A record of their traits and habits preserved from purely Aboriginal times into the 20th century would be a rich mine to the anthropologist of the future. Kroeber had been fascinated by newspaper accounts of wild Indians near Oroville. In 1908, a party of surveyors had stumbled on a hidden camp surprising a tiny band of Indians who disappeared into the brush. 
They had been hiding from the whites for 40 years. They were the last Yahi. Merle Apperson, the surveyor's guide, told Jerry Stevens what happened. I just proceeded to ask Merle about the whole thing, and he told me quite a story. And he was 15, and this uh, survey crew asked him to bring him in here. So they come up through the canyon here, and they was of cutting brush and a brushing out, and they come right into their camp. It spooked those Indians, and they run up underneath the bluff of the canyon. And they saw this something rolled up in the blanket, and they grabbed the blanket and just shook it, unrolled it, and it was in the old the old lady and rolled out, and they said she was real sick, just ready to die. And so then they went on. Of course, they had taken some bows and arrows and robes. Merle Apperson posed for the camera in a fur robe. The surveyors took everything the Indians needed to live through the winter. Three years later, in 1911, only one of the Indians was alive. He had singed off his hair in mourning for his lost companions. When Krober read the news of the wild man in Oroville, he immediately sent his assistant, T.T. Waterman, to meet him. Waterman brought a list of words in local Indian languages. Wintu, Maidu, Yana. My amateur attempts at Yana were unintelligible to him for a long time. An agreement was finally reached on the word for yellow pine, the material of which his cot was made, sewini. His face lightened up at this word. These were probably the first intelligible sounds he had heard from a human being in three years. Waterman sent for a northern Yana named Sam Botwe to interpret, but the two Indians spoke different dialects. Botwe said the man was from a tiny band related to the Yana called Yahi. Botwe did his best to translate, but for the most part the wild man had to communicate through gesture and pantomime. Krober got permission from the Bureau of Indian Affairs for Waterman to bring the man to San Francisco for study. Ad Kessler watched their departure from the Oroville train station. He was wearing a gray checkered suit, cutaway coat, and a straw hat. I noticed that he didn't have any shoes on. He was carrying them around in his hands. I would have liked to have had some more time with him. I always thought there was something there I should know, that I would like to know. To tell about the dead. The dead, they see a little at a time. The Yahi people told this story for thousands of years. It was called the journey of the dead. See in the west, keep going, the dead. They go south, they jump through the hole into the other world. After death, the spirits travel south, looking for an entrance to the other world. They go down into the ground, or they climb up through the sky and ride the wind. One week after he appeared in Oroville, the last Yahi journeyed south to a whole new world. 20th century America. Alfred Krober was waiting for him. On Labor Day, 1911, there stepped off the ferry boat into the shouting of hotel runners and the clanging of trolley cars on Market Street, San Francisco, the last wild Indian in the United States. Journalists crowded around demanding to know his name, but he would not respond. The strongest Indian etiquette demands that a person shall never tell his own name, at least not in reply to a direct request. Krober decided to call him Ishi, the Yahi word for man. He had found the Indian he was looking for. In Ishi, I can safely say that we have the most uncivilized and uncontaminated man in the world today. Anthropology was the Indian in America. Anthropologists were certain that Indian culture was dying. Ishi represented the last of his kind. 
and to capture him, to get the last Yahi words, the last of Yahi remembrance, was to was to achieve the pinnacle in anthropology, uh, to capture it forever before it disappeared forever, was the highest achievement, because the focus was on the disappearance, not on the survival. Kroeber gave Ishii a room in the Museum of Anthropology near Golden Gate Park. He was surrounded by exhibits of dead and dying cultures. On one of the tables, he found his family's bows, arrows, harpoons, and a fur cape stolen by the surveyors when they raided his camp. Ishii showed no bitterness, only surprise. Kroeber called history in California the pitiful history of little events. Kroeber once said that he couldn't stand the tears. Did he mean that he didn't like to see people suffering or he just simply didn't want to be drawn into that arena of strong uh, uh, despair and grief? Uh, I don't know. Uh, but he never dealt with, uh, with what the real history of California, which had been bloody and devastating to, to the native peoples. My whole point is that cultural history can begin only after the individual is totally subtracted. Kroeber worked with informants by eliciting information. He wanted to get the facts, get them right, get them quick, write them down, move on. Culture was understood to be in things. Whether those things were languages and grammars or baskets or canoe types or kinship terms. And so the museum was a logical expression of the determination to salvage culture because culture was represented by objects. Kroeber often had Indian informants stay at the museum for brief periods, but Ishii was different. He captured Kroeber's imagination. Who were the Yahi? What had happened to them? Could Ishii really have lived in hiding for 40 years? But Kroeber could not understand Ishii, and he doubted Batwi's translations. He telegraphed the brilliant linguist Edward Sapir. September 6, 1911, Dr. Edward Sapir. Have totally wild Indian at museum. Sapir was the only scholar who knew the Yana language, which was closely related to Yahi. Kroeber hoped he would come and help him communicate with Ishii. Do you want to come and work him up? If not, would appreciate immediate sending of list of Yana grammatical elements for better understanding of language and analyzing of texts. But Sapir was busy with his work in Canada and could not come. With Batwi's help, Kroeber tried to find a way into Ishii's world. Kroeber's assistant, Titi Waterman, observed... He has been curiously backward in telling the intimate history of his own immediate group. These people are dead, and to the Indian, that is ample cause for avoiding all mention of them. If they hear their names being mentioned, they may take it as a summons. Kroeber invited a few reporters to meet Ishii, but he would not answer any questions about his past. Instead, he told the tale of Wood Duck and how he wooed his bride. Ishii spoke into the recording device with great attention and purpose, while Batwi tried to translate for the reporters. The phone rang several times. Ishii protested, and Kroeber put the phone in a drawer. The wood duck story lasted for six hours. The story was clearly important to Ishii, but neither Kroeber nor the reporters knew what to make of it. Ishii came from a culture which conceived of the past in very different terms than we do. They start with the creation mythology, bring it down through, say, a clan history or something, and then say, and I was born and I've lived ever since, and that's the end. It may have been that Ishii had an entirely different way of conceiving of who he was and of his past than we do. Newspaper reporters demanded a press conference with Ishii. Kroeber arranged a photo session, assuming that Ishii would go along with the plan. Ishii agreed to wear animal skins, but he refused to take off his pants. 
He thought that would be improper in his new world. He rolled the pants up to his knees and draped the skins over them. It was advertised in the paper that Ishii would see people. My father took my sister and me to affiliated colleges. There was several anthropologists telling Ishii what to do. He was very much, if I may use the term, a wild Indian when I first saw him. He was supposed to show the people how he shot bows and arrows. And I remember very vividly that he was a pretty lousy shot. Then I remember him walking towards the people sitting there and pointing the bow and jabbering as though there was something wrong with the bow. Now, of course, at that time, it didn't mean anything to me, but since then, I very much suspected that, that the anthropologist had taken a bow from the exhibit and handed it to him, and it could have been from another tribe, maybe an enemy tribe or something, and it was all wrong for him. The voice of Caruso delighted Ishii. His first few weeks in San Francisco were full of discoveries. Waterman observed, To a primitive man, what ought to prove most astonishing in a modern city? Electric lights, doorknobs, safety pins, typewriters. He considered curious or wonderful. Getting water by turning a knob pleased him boundlessly. But for Ishii, the overwhelming thing about San Francisco was the number of people. After his arrival in San Francisco, he was taken for an automobile ride through Golden Gate Park to Ocean Beach. Everything else was forgotten, and the exclamation, Hansi Saltu, many white people, burst involuntarily from him. As a child, Ishii had never seen more than 40 people at one time. And they soon were gone. They walk around on the ground. Then they whirl. They whirl when people see. They go up through the sky on a rope. The dead. In the 1840s, before Ishii was born, the Yahi numbered around 400 people. Then the gold rush came. Thousands of 49ers swarmed through the heart of their country. As America expanded, there was this unofficial doctrine of manifest destiny. This was God's will that people populate this continent with complete disregard to the original inhabitants. Their freedom to use this country uh, to sustain themselves, which all Native people were doing at one time, uh, was taken away for the purposes of taking up their land base. So there seems to have been a passive acceptance that this race of people was destined to disappear. Every year, the Yahi struggled to find enough food for the winter. By the time Ishii was born, white settlers had moved into the area and were killing off the deer, replacing them with cattle and sheep. When hungry Indians took cattle for food, settlers banded together to kill Indians. In California, hunting Indians was both legal and profitable. County governments paid bounties of $5 a head, 50 cents a scalp. In 1854 alone, the federal government reimbursed the state for more than a million dollars in expense claims from Indian hunters. While it's true that it was the work of relatively few people that exterminated these people, what was the rest of the population thinking? Some individuals raised their voices against this violence, but I don't think it had a whole lot of support. The Americans at that time saw Indians as less than completely human. 
Instead of being brave and expert in the use of weapons and cunning in trapping of game, they are timid and idiotic, feeding on roots, snakes, and insects, and on the grasses of the fields the like men beasts. Are quite naked, and the men and boys especially look more like orangutans than human I'm beings. Coiled up together like a passel of snakes, my hand on a toad, tortoise, or a huge lizard. thought that Mr. Ishii needed a wife. He received several marriage proposals with photographs included. Ishii was invited to a vaudeville performance by an enterprising newspaper man in search of a story. Lily Lamia, a popular British music hall singer, was performing at the Orpheum. Krober, Waterman and Sam Botwe accompanied Ishii to the show. The newspaper man wrote, the last of the cavemen took his seat among the crimson plush draperies of the large box. At his side were learned pundits. Almost touching elbows with the saddle-colored primordial man were gentle women of the conquering people. Then, Lily Lanya appeared. Slowly, Ishi rose to his feet. Her eyes met those of the wild man. She faced him bravely with dazzling white arms held out toward the thunderstruck worshiper. Poor, simple-minded wild man. Krober remembered differently. The reporter got his story, but he got it out of his imagination. For two acts, Ishii sat and looked at the audience. It was the great crowds, 2,000 people packed into one place, which impressed him most, and for some time he did not even seem conscious of the stage or the players. Just one month after Ishii's arrival, Krober opened the Museum of Anthropology to the public. It was a great triumph for Krober the only museum west of the Mississippi devoted to the study of man. And he had something no one else had. A living exhibit. Ishii, the Stone Age man. Crowds flocked to see Ishii. His appearances were so popular that he began giving regular demonstrations every Sunday afternoon. He took pleasure in his work. He built a Yahi house behind the museum. Audiences watched him make fire with a fire drill and chip thousands of arrowheads. He was a master craftsman, and the crowds lined up for souvenir arrow points. Krober wrote to patron Phoebe Hurst. Dear Mrs. Hurst, in its first six months, the museum has been visited by 23,961 persons. We have become distinctly a Sunday institution. There have been more visitors on Sunday than on all weekdays and holidays combined. Ishii came down with pneumonia soon after the museum opened. He had no immunity to European diseases. But the public demanded to see him, and Krober obliged. Waterman remarked, Perhaps the only solution is to put him in an exhibition case. People could see him, but at least they would be prevented from touching him. Ishii was unique. He was bizarre, and the public loved that, in the same way that they loved mummies or the elephant man. Ishii was the wild boy that they, they brought from the jungle uh, 
from outer space, from someplace else, to entertain the public. Well, this is the public who liked to see then and now bizarre, strange things. I don't think they quite got it, Nishi, the nice man in overalls. April 14, 1914, Nishi, gambling song, Pantina, Pantina, Haina Nutea, same as 1698B. Using Sapir's list of Yana words, Krober and Waterman began the slow process of trying to analyze Ishii's language. They used the latest technology available to the new science of anthropology. The palatogram showed the position of the tongue as it formed sounds. The chymograph charted human speech. Ishii was telling them about Yahi life in the way his people had passed on knowledge for thousands of years. Through stories about the natural world, he made over 400 recordings on wax cylinders from the creation story to the journey of the dead. But Kroeber and Waterman did not understand what Ishii was trying to tell them. Even when they could translate the words, the meanings of the stories remained a mystery. Waterman was amazed at how well Ishii adapted to his new life. Ishii often went to Waterman's house for dinner and became a family friend. He convinced me that there is such a thing as gentlemanliness which lies outside of all training and is an expression purely of inward spirit. He had an inborn considerateness that surpassed in fineness all of the civilized breeding with which I am familiar. By this time, Ishii knew a few hundred words of English and could get along fairly well on his own. Kroeber gave him a job as janitor at the museum so he could stay on until the linguist Edward Sapir came to work with him. Ishii learned to ride the trolleys, made friends with neighborhood children, and often visited the hospital next door to the museum. Ishii was fascinated by doctors. At the hospital, he met Saxton Pope, who became his friend and physician. He accompanied Pope on his rounds and often sang healing songs in Yahi to the patients. Pope admired Ishii's skill as a hunter and woodsman. He taught me to make bows and arrows, how to shoot them, how to hunt Indian fashion. He knew the history and use of everything in the outdoor world. He was a wonderful companion in the woods, and many days and nights we journeyed together. Krober was criticized by newspaper reporters for keeping Ishii at the museum. The Secretary of the Interior came to San Francisco to investigate his treatment. Ishii was told that he was free to go back where he came from or to go where other Indians lived under the care of the American government. But Ishii did not want to live on a reservation, and the government had given the Yahi land to ranchers. There was no place for him to go. He promptly shook his head. I want to stay where I am. I will grow old here and die in this house. They go down in the ground in the north, through a hole in the ground. They came and made it split, split open, down in the ground. Ishi still would not talk about his past. Krober found accounts written by men who had killed most of the Yahi 50 years before. Five vigilantes, Robert Anderson, Sim and Jake Moak, Pai Good and Sandy Young, repeatedly attacked the Yahi villages 
when Ishii was a child. Sometimes they shot the men and sold the women and children to ranchers. Other times they killed everyone they found. These Indian hunters became local heroes. We ran down to the Indian camp where all was confusion. The attack had come upon them like a thunderbolt out of a clear sky. They did not dream of a white man being within miles of them. We crowded forward and poured a hot fire into the Indians from upstream, while Good's men hammered them out from below. Into the stream they leaped, but few got out alive. Many dead bodies floated down the rapid current. Ishii's father was killed at Three Knolls, along with most of the villagers. Ishii and his mother escaped by jumping into the water and floating downstream among the dead bodies. hundred years after the Campesico massacre took place, we found a human skull and a mandible that looked like it had been shattered by a bullet. And what had happened was that they had taken some cattle. These uh, animals had been butchered and they were in the process of drying the meat. And these uh, local ranchers came along and they massacred about 45 people and just left their bodies lying all over the ground. There was probably not enough Yahi left to come back to bury him. The bones had rolled down under rocks and been protected from the storms, and so the bone had preserved. And in fact, there was even still some uh, dried uh, tissue, uh, uh, soft tissue on the bone. And so it's almost like these people died last week, and it was very disturbing. In this remote and seemingly safe spot were gathered more than 30 yahi, including young children and babies. They were helpless against the four armed men who forthwith killed them all. Kingsley exchanged his rifle for a revolver because the rifle tore them up so bad, particularly the babies. Ishii and his mother went into hiding with few survivors. Then they are done. The people, they are finished. Look north, look west, look east. Krober had uncovered the painful history of the Yahi. He knew how they had died. But he wanted to see for himself how Ishi had lived and how he had managed to hide all those years. In the spring of 1914, he decided to make an expedition with Ishii back into Yahi country. But Ishii refused to go. Ishii was approaching this from a different point of view. He was thinking in terms of what had happened to his family, what had happened to him when he was there in 1911 and 1908. Whereas Krober and Waterman and Pope were thinking, God, you know, we're going to get to go out and really see Ishii interact with the environment. We're going to be able to ask him all kinds of questions. So I think that those things made all of those people feel very happy, but I think Ishii was looking at it from a different point of view. Krober insisted on going, and finally Ishii agreed. At the last minute, he discovered that the food for the trip had been stored in the museum bone room. He said it was contaminated and again refused to go. When the scientists claimed they bought new food, he reluctantly changed his mind. Ishii set out on his second journey by ferry and train, this time heading north into his past. Waterman Pope and Pope's young son, Saxton Jr., accompanied Ishii and Krober on the trip. Krober hired Jack and Merle Apperson as guides. 
Ishii remembered the Appersons from five years earlier when the surveyors had raided his last camp. The Appersons showed them some of the souvenirs they had taken from that raid. While Ishii watched, Krober bargained with Neural for the artifacts. Apperson's cow camp near an old Yahi village site and settled in for a four week stay. What we need to do is put the water in the dam. Jerry Johnson, Brian Bibby, and Jim Johnston have been searching for clues to Ishii's story for more than 20 years. They have explored his country extensively, but have never found the remote ledge where Ishii was living when the surveyors invaded his camp. Yahi were traveling much. Uh, very far out of their territory. Over the past 22 years, I've been in there many times where this man lived, trying to participate in that reality by being there. Armed with Krober's photographs, notebooks, and maps, they set out to retrace the 1914 expedition. Nobody can tell you what Ishii was thinking, how he felt. It's all you can do is put yourself in his place. When Krober's expedition arrived at Deer Creek, Ishii was anxious about what he would find. According to young Saxton Pope Jr. Ishii was worried that the spirits of his lost relatives would still be roaming over the land. He told me that the voice of his sister was calling him. One night Ishii slipped away and disappeared into the brush. When he came back, he told me his people were not lost, that they had found their way. After that night, Ishii seemed to be relaxed and content to be back in his country. Just think of yourself without any of your family alive, just you in the world. Nobody to talk to. How do you hold yourself together under those circumstances with everybody and everything I've ever known gone? When you look at the creation stories and all of the mythology that Ishi would have grown up with, those things prepare you for an imperfect world. At one point of the creation story, they talk about how people will fall off of cliffs and die. People will swim in the river and drown. People will be poisoned by bad men. That's the way it is. In the Yahi creation story, Coyote is both foolish and wise. Handling fire, he drops it and sets the world ablaze. And so there he is, and the world's all burning up and he's running around wondering how to save himself. Finally he comes to this pretty good sized oak tree and he says, can you help me? And the oak tree says, well I will burn on the outside but I will be safe inside. And so there's a little knot hole there, you know, where a branch is broken off and he dives in head first. The only problem is, is his feet are sticking out. So as the fire comes blazing by, you know, it, it burns his feet. So he wakes up in the morning and uh, he thinks he's fine. He looks out on the ground there and he says, oh, look at my, uh, he calls them Chunoeno grasshoppers. And it's his feet and his toes all burnt up to a crisp down there on the ground. 
And he reaches down and picks them up and devours them. When I think about Coyote in the culture, his unpredictability is translated over to the unpredictability of life in general. And I think of Ishi being uh, shown uh, the example of a man flying in an airplane. And I think what a lot of people felt was, you know, this is just going to floor him. And uh, he looked up and said, is there a white man up there? And they said, yes. And he laughed. And that is just like a coyote story for him. It was here that Krober entered Ishii's world. Ishii became the teacher. The scientists were the novices. He showed them how to fish with a harpoon, hunt deer with a bow and arrow. When he couldn't find deer, Ishii blamed it on Pope for smoking and insisted that he stop. In Yahi religion, if we want to use that word religion, if you don't go by the proper rules of taking the life of this animal, then there is an offense there, and that supply may be cut off. So they had a very practical purpose in being cleansed, because you don't want the deer to smell you. But the other part of that was that you cleansed yourself in a spiritual way, mind and body, to go take upon this act to kill this creature. <laughs> Pope stopped smoking and they finally shot a deer. Ishi skinned and butchered the animal as the Yahi had done for thousands of years. Wati, big mineral spring. Klazmak, ridge with snow. Asiwi Wawi, ledge with caves. Pitsnaitka, chimney cave above Mill Creek. Here, Yahi life became real to Krober. Ishi's words took on new meaning. Ishi told Krober more than 200 Yahi place names. He knew every rock and stream, every plant and animal in his country, and had names for all of them. He showed Krober a hundred plants used for food and medicine. Hanmawi Madu, Salt Lake up Pine Creek. Wamatwi, Table Mountain. Kulu, Juncture of Big and Little Mill Creek. See, so on Waterman's map, the crossing is number 21, I believe. So that shows Grizzly Bear's hiding place, which is number 19 here. Johnson and Bibby began their final search for the remote ledge where Ishii had been living when the surveyors invaded his camp. Ishii called it Bear's hiding place. If you never actually experienced the environment that he lived in at the end of his life, I think that you would always feel that you didn't have the whole story. No one had been there since Krober's trip with Ishii, nearly 80 years before. Krober wrote in his journal, As soon as these stretches began to be penetrated, it was discovered why the Indians had so long eluded communication. Every foot of ground and cranny of stone is covered with an impenetrable dense growth of oak and other scrub.
Finally, Johnson and Bibby found the remains of the last Yahi village. This is it. We've got it. We're standing here. Here's where Crover was. Here's where Waterman was. Here's where Ishii was. Waterman and Kruber were struck by the harsh restrictions of Yahi life during the 40 years they were forced to live here. The houses were built where they were invisible from the cliffs on either side. In making paths through the brush, they bent aside the twigs. Cutting or breaking them would have made the path much more conspicuous. Every evidence of the Indian's work shows the same unceasingly painstaking care to avoid detection. They have evidently learned to prize their liberty above everything else. Ishii and his family managed to remain undetected until the surveyors discovered their camp. It's a very sad chapter in American history uh, when you think that a people lived in this, in their own homeland for over 4,000 years and it is, it gets to a point where you are pushed into a brushy patch below some lava rock living in fear for your life. In that regard, it's a very symbolic spot to me, it's a, it's a kind of, uh, it's, like, it's like visiting a battlefield in a way, you know, the way that people are drawn to a, a spot like Gettysburg or, you know, something of that nature. You know, it, there's something terrible about it, but there's something also meaningful. I mean, it's, it's a reflective kind of a thing. Man will get hurt from falling. He'll swim in water. He'll drift away and die. He'll fall down a precipice. He'll be struck by an arrow point. He'll be lost. It will be said. It will be like this, they said. the Panama Pacific International Exposition opened in San Francisco. The exposition celebrated the opening of the Panama Canal and the winning of the West. Manifest destiny had prevailed. The country now spread from sea to sea. At the center of the fair stood a huge statue called the End of the Trail. The plaque read, the drooping, storm-beaten figure of the Indian on the spent pony symbolizes the end of the race which was once a mighty people. Native Americans were no longer seen as obstacles to expansion. Their image had changed from savage heathens to romanticized, tragic figures. Ishi, the last Yahi, was a featured attraction at the fair. Officials from the Great Northern Railway approached Krober with a publicity stunt to induct Ishii into the Blackfeet tribe. At the last minute, Ishii understood the purpose of the ceremony and refused to take part. He was Yahi. By this time, Ishii communicated his day-to-day -day needs through animated gestures and pidgin English, but he could not explain the meanings behind his songs and stories. Finally, in the summer of 1915, Krober convinced the linguist Edward Sapir to come to San Francisco and work with Ishii. Krober was now free to leave for Europe on his long-delayed sabbatical. Ishii began by telling Sapir the creation story. Sapir wrote down the Yahi words while Ishii acted out their meanings. I think I may safely say that my work with Ishii is by far the most time-consuming and nerve-wracking that I have ever undertaken. Ishii's imperturbable good humor alone made the work possible, though it also adds at times to my exasperation. With his perfect ear for language, Sapir wrote down every nuance of Ishii's speech. 
even his cartoon voices for characters like Coyote. Sapir and Ishii worked hard every day that summer. In August, Ishii collapsed. Sapir wrote to Krober. Dear Dr. Krober, there is a sad side to this recital. Ishii became decidedly ill and had to be removed to the University Hospital in San Francisco. I am afraid that Ishii has tuberculosis, and the prospect for a cure seems far from certain. Ishii and Sapir's collaboration ended after only three months. The work they did together was valuable, but incomplete. Dr. Saxton Pope had one more photograph taken of Ishii. At this period, when he seemed to be failing so rapidly that the end must be near, I coaxed him to get out of bed and let me take his picture once more. He was always happy to be photographed and accommodated me. It was only after the picture was developed that I realized to what a pitiful condition he'd been reduced. Had this been apparent before, I should not have asked this exertion of him. Ishii believed that the body must be whole for the spirit to reach the land of the dead. When Krober heard that Ishii was dying, he worried that the doctors would perform an autopsy. He immediately wrote to Waterman. As to disposal of the body, I must ask you as my personal representative on the spot in this matter to yield nothing at all under any circumstances. If there is any talk about the interests of science, say for me that science can go to hell. We propose to stand by our friends. When Ishii became too weak to talk, he spoke to Pope with hand gestures, saying, you stay here. I am going ahead. Krober's letter arrived too late. An autopsy was performed. Ishii's brain was preserved and his body cremated. His ashes were placed in a local cemetery. Their bodies rolled up, flexed, stiff and cold. They go south. They jump through the hole one by one. Waterman was deeply affected by Ishii's death, but felt that the hard work had been justified. He wrote to Krober. The work last summer was too much for him. He was the best friend I had in the world, and I killed him by letting Sapir ride him too hard. All the same, I feel like congratulating you and asking for your congratulations for the material Sapir got. He was bound to go this way sooner or later, and we certainly were none too soon in obtaining the material from him. Krober began to question his professional life. He took a leave of absence from Berkeley and entered psychoanalysis. Two years later, he returned to anthropology and quickly rose to the top of his field. He never wrote another word about Ishii. He stored the Yahi materials away and rarely spoke of his friend. When he did, it was with deep feelings of loss. He was industrious, kindly, obliging, invariably even-tempered, ready of smile, and thoroughly endeared himself to all with whom he came in contact. With his death, the Yahi passed away. One person goes through at a time. 
they shut the door and climb up the sky.